Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar, Reserve Studies Under the Hood, is designed to be an introduction to reserve studies from a homeowner, board member, or manager's point of view. So today I'm going to answer questions like what's a reserve study and what's it for? What do you find in a reserve study and some hints on how to help you find it? What do you do with a reserve study? What size contributions are normal? If these are the types of questions on your mind, I'll have answers for you in just a few minutes. So today we're going to pop open the hood and take a look inside. I hope you're ready to see what this thing called the reserve study does and see how the parts connect and see how it helps take your association to the future. I'm going to use examples from the reserve studies of many different companies because this session is a general introduction based on National Reserve Study Standards. It applies to all associations and all reserve study companies, not just association reserves. And as Chris mentioned, my name's Robert Nordland. I've been preparing reserve studies for a little over 25 years and have done thousands of them. So while it's second nature to me, it's not as familiar to you. So since this is a live webinar, as I go through today's material, as Chris mentioned, if you have any questions, type it in the question dialog box, which is probably on the right-hand side of your screen in your webinar control panel. Uh, just type in your question in the space provided. Chris is going to monitor those throughout the session, and I'll handle them at uh, the end of the session at the Q&A time together. And to get you comfortable with the dialog box, and to get us communicating, there's a little hands raised icon to give you uh, to give me a little bit of feedback. So why don't you click that hands raised icon to show that you're with me and following along? Very good. I've got a few more people. Little hands raised icon. I'm going to be speaking. You're going to be listening. Great. Let's do this together. Okay, excellent. I'm going to put everyone's hands down. And let me get started with today's curriculum. A reserve study is a report. It's going to be custom for each association with different information each year. It will look something generically like this, a report for your association for a particular year. It will contain a number of charts and graphs showing a breakdown of current needs and projections and recommendations for future years. You'll find it based fundamentally on some tables of information, components, years, and expenses. Sometimes you'll see some color in the reserve study to bring additional meaning or emphasis. And then there's often going to be trends, multi-year trends often shown graphically, sometimes in color and even like in this reserve study in 3D. And then even more tables, more color and more columns of numbers, income and expenses. Some have plenty of text to read in addition to the graphics. And if the scope of work involved a site inspection, you'll often find pictures documenting the condition of the components seen on site. So with all the different formats and types of information you're almost being bombarded with, it's no surprise the average person finds the subject of reserve studies confusing. What's the information that I need to know? And just trying to figure out where to find the good stuff. So. I'm going to take a few steps back today, start at the beginning, and come in the front door. Let's start out with some basics. This is what a good common area tennis court looks like. And this is what a bad common area tennis court looks like. What's the difference? The difference is the amount of money the board chose to collect from the homeowners through the years for the timely repair and replacement of the reserve components. In this case, the board didn't have the money needed by the association. Many boards have good, atten good intentions, hoping things will all work out as they go into the future, but they figure reserves are not their problem. They figure that future boards and future homeowners 
will worry about those future problems. They've got enough problems of their own today. But that's a recipe for failure, which means special assessments or deferred maintenance. But thinking reserves are a future problem reveals fundamentally wrong thinking. The truth is that deterioration happens every day. Deterioration and the cost of deterioration, the roof, the painting, the asphalt, the elevator, they're all getting older and less valuable, less useful each day. The association might only face a reserve bill once every few years, but remember that that deterioration is not a future problem. It's a today problem. With advanced planning today, the association, excuse me, without advanced planning today, the association is doomed to have special assessments or deferred maintenance in the future, or both. And another important concept to understand is that deterioration is inevitable, and it's the board's responsibility to offset that deterioration with a plan to take care of the common areas. Homeowners are not responsible to take care of the pool they enjoy. In fact, you don't want the homeowners messing with anything having to do with the pool. It's the board's responsibility to offset that deterioration and take care of the common area assets with a plan to take care of those assets into the future. Individuals and the families that live in the association are relying on the board to fulfill their responsibility to take care of the common areas for them. But in order for the board members to fulfill their responsibility, they need a plan. Reserve expenses are so big that they take years of financial preparation. Boards need to know years ahead which reserve bills are coming, when they're coming, so they can prepare financially. A reserve study is the planning tool a board uses to provide for the timely repair and replacement of the scheduled reserve projects. Another fundamental concept with reserves is that while reserve deterioration is a daily event, the bills for that daily deterioration happen infrequently, scattered through the years. So from one year to the next, you have tremendously irregular reserve expenses. One year might have expenses 20 times higher than the year before. It's a very difficult, irregular set of expenses to plan for. And without a reserve study, those expenses look random. So a reserve study removes the randomness and surprise factor. It takes those irregular expenses and allows you to prepare for them with a stable income stream. All too many boards and managers think the expenses are unpredictable and figure that that planning ahead is too complicated, as I indicated a moment ago, just leaving it as a problem for future boards to deal with. But that's because they don't have a reserve say to give them their decision points and act as a guide. Without a current year credible reserve study, you are forced to guess and hope for the best. But wishful thinking is not an effective plan. And wishful thinking is not a successful way for board members to carry out the responsibility to the homeowners. But a reserve study is more than just a report that provides budget guidance for the board. A reserve study is a document you can use to deal with the anxieties and rumors at your association. I heard the roof was leaking. What's going to be done about the asphalt? Things like that. By distributing the reserve study to your homeowners, you minimize the misinformation and surprise among association members. Communicate the plan to take care of the association, and there's going to be less rumors and anxiety among the homeowners. They'll understand that there is a plan and things are going to get taken care of. So, what type of budget help do you actually get from a reserve study? And what information will you be communicating to the homeowners in this plan? Well, let me illustrate by talking about taking a road trip, getting from point A to point B. You need to know your starting point and your destination and have a plan to get there. Really, that's it. And that's all there is to understanding a reserve study. It's all about defining where I'm going, which is 
in this case, trying to take a trip to see a Broadway show on the Statue of Liberty in New York. Where am I starting? In this map, we're starting in Denver. And then deciding how am I going to get there? That means taking the necessary action, packing, filling up the car, and picking some overnight stops along the way. Well, fortunately, in the field of reserves, we have a good road map. It's called National Reserve Study Standards. And since 1998, these standards have given us a common terminology, standard calculations, standard disclosures, and they provide us a framework for creating and communicating these plans to board, me board members, managers, and homeowners. These National Reserve Study Standards tell us that every reserve study has three parts each one providing some key information. The three parts are, as you can see on the screen, the reserve component list, an evaluation of reserve fund strength, which is typically reported in terms of percent funded, and a reserve funding plan. The component list defines what your journey is all about, what assets you're caring for with reserve funds. A computation of reserve fund strength tells you where you're starting what you're dealing with, what resources you're dealing with at your starting point. And a funding plan is your chosen route or plan to provide funds for the timely repairs or replacement projects defined by your reserve component list. So the component list forms the foundation or the definition of the journey you're about to accomplish. Success will be the timely repair or replacement of your scheduled projects. Failure means not accomplishing your objective, which in the field of reserves means special assessments or deferred maintenance. Reserve fund strength and the funding plan are both computed based on that reserve component list. They're both only as accurate or effective as the reserve component list is accurate. Okay, crack open a reserve study. What are you looking for? Here's what a typical reserve component list looks like from an actual reserve study. It shows a table showing the scope of major projects the association is going to care for. That's the list of projects. And you're going to be able to build a schedule of when those projects occur from the useful life and remaining useful life factors that you see on this table. And here's a sample reserve component list that I've created big enough so you can see as I explain. The important information you'll find in a reserve component list is a description of the project, its useful life, years of remaining useful life, and current replacement cost. The components that appear in the list should have passed the National Reserve Study Standard four-part test for screening reserve projects. And that four-part test, let me tell you quickly, is it needs to be a common area maintenance responsibility. The project needs to have a limited useful life. It needs to have a predictable remaining useful life. And the project needs to be above a minimum threshold of significance. So major common area repair and replacement projects that are predictable. And that list defines the scope of your reserve projects. The list is based on that national standard four-part test. and it's influenced by local state requirements. In Florida, where we have some listeners today, condos need to reserve for roofing, building repainting, pavement, and other projects that together are over $10,000. In other words, projects that would have met National Reserve State standards. And I believe we have a few Washington State listeners in today. And Washington State condos are required to consider what we now call the big seven, roofing, painting, paving, decks, siding, plumbing, and windows. And again, no surprise, these are components that would have been picked up through the National Reserve Study Standard four-part test. And the combination of useful life and remaining useful life defines the schedule of when those projects are going to occur in the future. And as you're looking at a reserve study, you're going to see that some reserve studies lay out that schedule vertically a year at a time. Some show it horizontally across the page, again, a year at a time. And so in summary, the reserve component list shows the information about the major components, 
the association will be maintaining with reserves, which defines the scope and schedule of your anticipated reserve expenses. Everyone with me? Let me get a, a hands raised. Can I get a hands raised that the component list provides scope and schedule of your reserve projects? Click on the hands raised icon. Very good, you're finding that. Okay, I'm going to put everyone's hands down now. And we'll go on to the next point. Measuring reserve fund strength. National Reserve Study Standards require an evaluation of reserve fund strength to reveal how well the current reserve funds fit the needs of the association. That gives board management and the homeowners an indication of their starting point. Now since small associations need a significantly different amount of reserves compared to large associations, and the amount of cash reserves an association needs varies from year to year, depending on the schedule of the reserve projects. In this industry, we report reserve fund strength on a fit basis, using a term called percent funded. Percent funded reports how well the reserve cash fits the reserve needs of the association in any given year. There's three situations an association can find itself in. Associations with more deterioration than reserve fund cash are in a deficit situation. Associations with reserves on hand approximately equal to the amount of their common area deterioration can claim to be in balance. And associations with more reserve cash than deterioration can claim to be in a surplus situation. They've collected more than their common area assets have deteriorated. So it's all a matter of comparing the deterioration of the association's reserve components to the size of the reserve fund. Knowing your reserve fund strength is important because special assessments are directly related to the strength of an association's reserve fund. But special assessments are not random. It's really not surprising when you think about it. When an association's percent funded reveals that the association hasn't prepared financially for the scheduled reserve projects, it often finds itself without enough cash and faces special assessments and deferred maintenance. And the more serious the deficit is, the closer the association gets to zero, the higher the chance of a special assessment. And here's a table summarizing that same information, showing the importance of knowing your percent funded. You're able to report that when the reserve fund is weak, when it's in the 0 to 30 percent range, associations experience a 37 percent of special assessments. That means a little more than one third of the time. On the other hand, special assessments, as you can see, are rare among associations in the strong range, over 70 percent funded. And in the middle, the 30 to 70 percent range, associations have about a 10 percent risk of special assessments. So that's right there, the value of setting aside the appropriate amount of reserves. So you'll be able to execute the projects on time without having to rely on a special assessment. Now let's transition to the process of getting to your destination, actually funding your reserves, making progress towards that goal of having sufficient reserves for your timely repair of your reserve projects. But first, uh, let me stop and make sure you understand that those percent funded calculations we just talked about are not related to funding plan calculations. National Reserve Study Standards define an equation how percent funded is calculated. But those same standards define different ways or different methods to fund reserves. You've possibly heard of the straight line method or the cash flow method. You can even choose uh, different methods, uh, throwing darts at the wall if you want, although we don't recommend that, to fund reserves. Or you can just do as so many associations do, choose the method of just funding their reserves with what's left over from the operational expenses. The method you use on the right side to fund your reserves is very different from the percent funded calculations on the left. They define your starting point and your reserve funding plan calculations or your theory or your process 
will affect the size of the reserve fund and then the percent funded in future years. You're free to create a funding plan with whatever methodology you choose. It's not related to the percent funded calculations. So what you're trying to accomplish with your reserve funding plan is to make sure the association has enough funds for the timely repair and replacement of your scheduled reserve projects without relying on those unfair and uncertain special assessments. You're never quite sure if the homeowner is going to vote yes on that special assessment. A strong reserve fund means a less risk of special assessment and a weak reserve fund meets a higher risk of special assessment. So how much money does it take? Well, it's obviously a different amount at every association depending on the size of the association, the construction style, the types of common area assets, the amount of deterioration, possibly the overall age of the association. It's a number of factors. Most associations find that an appropriate amount of reserve contributions are anywhere from 15 to 40 percent of their total budget. The light blue that you see on the screen represents reserve contribution portion. Purple represents represents operating expenses. How much for your association this year is found in your reserve study? But typically you'll find it's somewhere in the 15 to 40 percent range. It shouldn't swing from 15 to 40 percent or back again. It'll have its normal spot. The average is somewhere in the 25 percent range and it'll fluctuate a little bit above, a little bit down. We see just a few percentage points, uh, two, three, four percentage points uh, from high to low, wherever your sweet spot is at your association. But you need to understand that reserve contributions are a significant portion of the annual, of the average association's budget. So whichever method you use to determine your reserve calculations, the straight line or the cash flow or what we call here the head in the sand method, where you ignore it and hope it'll go away, what counts is results. What counts is what it's going to do to affect your ability to pay for reserve projects in the future, getting to your destination successfully. So comparing straight line cash flow and head in the sand method is going to take more time than we have today. We've been able to cover that comparing and contrasting funding plans in more detail in our Reserve Studies 102 and 103 webinars. So for the purpose of this overview today, I just want you to understand that results are more important than the tool or the method you use to create those results. As an example, let me explain that the cash flow method is so flexible it can accomplish the same conservative funding goal that's usually associated with a straight line method. And you can even accomplish it more efficiently and more effectively. So the methods begin to become almost uh, insignificant. What's more important is the results, getting to that destination. And of course, what's the consequence of running out of gas or running out of energy? Well, it's running out of money. In our car trip illustration, you're faced with this. It means not reaching your goal of providing enough cash for the scheduled repair and replacement of the projects at the association. So what if you aren't making your recommended reserve contributions? Well, you need to start. If your association has a history of deferred maintenance and special assessments, your homeowners deserve better. Remember, your homeowners are depending on you, board members, and you, managers, to uh, assist those board members in collecting enough funds on an ongoing basis so they're not surprised someday with a special assessment letter. And if that membership won't pass a special assessment or if the board is reluctant just plain to spend the money, the association ends up with deferred maintenance. And deferred maintenance, unfortunately, often causes reserve projects to get even more expensive and it has the side effect of dropping property values. So it's important to avoid that deferred maintenance. And while I'm on the topic of funding your reserves, let me remind you that the effects of interest do not equal the effects of inflation. 
This matters because you only earn interest on your reserve cash in the bank, which is always going to be a whole lot less than the total value of, res of your reserve projects, which grows with inflation each year. Well, now that you know what type of information is provided in the reserve study, let me take a moment to explain the three types of reserve studies. Like the chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry ice cream you see here, National Reserve Study Standards define three types of reserve studies. You need to understand the difference because you need to know which one is right for your association. The three types of reserve studies are full, update with site visit, and update no site visit. A full reserve study is something most associations will only ever need to do once because it involves measuring all the common area assets and establishing fundamentally that initial reserve component list. After that, every few years it's good to have an update with site visit reserve study where every asset is inspected, but it's a less expensive engagement because the assets aren't being all remeasured. It takes less time. For example, once you know you have 85,000 square feet of asphalt, or 7.2 miles of it, you don't need to pay for another full reserve study to have it, or the roof, or the fencing, or the carpeting all remeasured. Save your money, spend it on reserve projects, not a reserve professional level that you don't need. An update no site visit is a good cost effective choice for the years in between update with site visits. This type of reserve study updates your replacement costs, remaining useful life, starting balance, percent funded, and funding plan, all without the time, effort, and cost of mobilizing someone to come on site and make a lot of observations. This is the simplest and least expensive type of reserve study. And of course, who do you choose to prepare your reserve study? Or from whom might you request a proposal for the type of reserve study you need? There's certainly a range out there. I'm going to recommend you look for two credentials, both very similar. The Reserve Specialist, or RS, is one of the professional credentials available through the Community Association Institute. You might know them as CAI. And the PRA is the Professional Reserve Analyst designation awarded by the Association of Professional Reserve Analysts. It's a um, private, non-for-profit, a professional organization of reserve uh, professionals. Both of those designations, the RS and the PRA, have similar educational background requirements, experience requirements, and they both share the same terminology and disclosure requirements. Now, <clears throat> once you have your reserve study, hopefully by a credential provider, and you've decided on a recommended reserve contribution, we often get the question, what do you actually do? Who do you give your reserve contributions to? Well, you actually give them to yourself. You making your reserve contributions just means making a transfer of your budgeted reserve contribution amount from checking to savings. And in your monthly budget report, what you do is show that you've moved the appropriate amount from checking to savings. Some associations go to the extra effort of breaking down the reserve transfer into a number of different categories and accounting for or trying to account for the change in the size of those reserve categories on an ongoing basis. But don't worry, that's not necessary. It's actually a, a wasted effort. Even if you attempt to track the balances of all the different reserve funds, your reserve professional or re your reserve study software will probably reallocate it all the next year. So don't go to this level of detail in accounting for your reserve transfers. Just making the monthly total from operating to reserves is the key. And then when it comes time to pay for a reserve project, all you do is move the amount back from savings into your checking account so you can write a check to the vendor. So the normal process is to transfer funds into reserves on a regular basis and then withdraw the funds from reserves irregularly in advance of actually paying the bill for that reserve project. All right, so how do you read a reserve study? <clears throat> how do you find the good stuff? Well, the key is to know what you're looking for because it's going to be in different places in each company's different reserve format. But remember the basics. 
you're primarily looking for the reserve component list, an evaluation of reserve fund strength, and a recommended reserve funding plan. What do those things look like? Let me crack open a few reserve studies and show you. In this company's format, you'll find a lot right on the cover. You see the professional's designation, you'll see the type of reserve study, it's an update with site visit, and you'll see the date, the year that it's meant to cover. And in this report, you see a nice, clear presentation of the reserve component list. In this company's report, the year and the funding recommendation appear on their executive summary page. So are you getting the, the drift that this information will be in different places in different companies' formats? <clears throat> and here's what a typical 30-year recommended funding plan looks like. You can see the, the whole 30 years gradually growing through the years as the reserves are set aside towards the necessary projects. And here's yet another executive summary page. This one I like because it shows the reserve fund strength very clearly. It shows it nice and color-coded, and it shows the recommended contribution amount. Two of those three critical pieces of information are right in the executive summary. So in different companies' reserve studies, the information is on different pages, but it's all there. It's all a matter of knowing what you're looking for. Okay, the other key information to look for, help you understand what you're looking at, well, in a car, if you're looking at a used car, you look for the make, model, year, and mileage. So in a reserve study, in addition to the component list, percent funded, and recommended contribution, you should also look for the fiscal year for which the report was prepared because it helps you understand if the reserve study is current or outdated. And you also should look for who prepared the report to see if it's someone with an RS or PRA. And that shows how reliable it is. And look for what type of reserve study it is. A full, an update with site visit, or an update no site visit, because that tells you how the report was prepared. But as I look at the time and I look at the material that we've covered, I imagine your mind is swirling. So let me try to bring the subject back into focus and bring this uh, session in for a landing. What are you going to find under the hood in a reserve study. Well, remember, a reserve study helps you plot a successful journey into the future. Without it, you're bound to stumble and fail. A reserve study answers the three questions, what am I trying to accomplish, where am I, and how do I get to my destination? The answer to that first question of what you're trying to accomplish in this journey is the timely repair and replacement of the projects defined in your reserve component list. The second, where am I question, is answered by reserve fund strength, best reported in terms of percent funded. And I showed you how that tells you your exposure to a special assessment. And the how do I get there is your recommended reserve contribution rate. It's your association. You've got a lot of important decisions to make, but you can avoid guessing and all the wishful thinking that comes with that when you get the direction you need with a current credible reserve study prepared according to National Reserve Study Standards. So set yourself up for success by keeping your reserve study current and learning from the reserve study how to adequately fund your reserves so the scheduled repair and replacements can get accomplished in a timely manner. I'd like to uh, conclude this by thanking you for joining us today in this overview of working with reserve study, looking under the hood to see what's going on. If you would like further information, I encourage you to go to our website, www.reservestudy.com. It looks something like this. And a couple of my recommendations are for you to visit our Learning Center, where you'll find some helpful articles, our monthly webinar schedule, and recordings of prior webinars, and a link to where you can request a proposal for an updated reserve study for your association. And with that, I'll conclude my portion of the presentation. Contact information is there for Chris. And Chris, I'd like to turn the microphone over to you so you can handle a few questions with the uh, remaining time that we have until the end of the session. Chris, all yours. Great. Thank you.